Hello, I'm Valerie Biden-Owens, chair of the Biden Institute at the University of Delaware. Today, I have the privilege of introducing Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who represents New York's 14th district since 2019. Thank you, Congresswoman, for joining us on this episode of All Politics is Personal, a program where we introduce the public to the person behind the politician. Anyone can research your policies and accomplishments. We know that you're the youngest woman and the youngest Latina to ever serve in Congress. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about you. So let's start with your childhood, what it was like growing up Ocasio-Cortez. Well, I grew up in a very boisterous family, and I grew up, I think, between a lot of different worlds. Uh, my father was born and raised in the Bronx. I was born in the Bronx. My mother was born and raised in Puerto Rico. And I grew up uh, just outside of New York City in a town called Yorktown Heights. And so I grew up, you know, between a lot of different environments and a lot of different places. It gave me a lot of perspective. My family was really warm, lots of humor. And uh, we learned how to really take it on the chin a lot too mm. and and really kind of rib each other a lot as well. Was it a multi-generational home? Did your grandparents live with you or yes. aunts and uncles? I yes. mean everybody came to our house and, and lived with us for months at a time. Yeah, yeah, it was very similar, a very multi-generational household. My grandmother um, also helped raise me as well. She lived with us and she was a really big green thumb so she taught me a lot about gardening and um, and also brought some of her practices from Puerto Rico, making little tinctures and rubs and oils. Do you know how to do like any of it? Do you remember? I remember some of it. Um, and whenever I go back to Puerto Rico, my, my grandmother who moved back there teaches me new things too. Yeah. Uh, where, did, where did you go to school? I went to a public school, Yorktown High School is where I went to high school. Um, I went to school systems in that town from K through 12, and then I went to Boston University for college. I read someplace that you said uh, education should not be determined be determined by your zip code. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about that. Yeah, you know, I think education was actually one of the first uh, forays that I had into a lot of community work. It's always been very important to me because I grew up, um, I was born in the Bronx, and this was a time in the late 80s and early 90s where high school you know, and school dropout rates were really high in the Bronx, and my parents um, were young, they didn't know what to do, and they felt that the only way for me to get an education would be to go to a school in a different zip code. And so we uprooted out of our community and I always felt a very strong sense of injustice about that from the time I was a young age because all my cousins, who I was very close with, uh, stayed behind in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And growing up, I always knew that we were all of the same capacity. We were all just as smart, just as hardworking, uh, just as diligent, just as talented. But just because of the zip code that they were in, and the schools and the poverty um, that we were surrounded by, we would have very different outcomes and opportunities. And so my father still worked in the Bronx and my family, the rest of my family is still in the Bronx. So I spent a lot of time uh, in both communities, but I, my parents moved me uh, to a school district when I was maybe five years, before I started kindergarten. Oh, okay. And, um, and it, but I always grew up so, you know, often shuttling between these disparities that it very much shaped me a lot growing up, yeah. Uh, in school, were you uh, the teacher's pet? Were you the uh, student government leader? What, or the sports girl? What, how would you describe your high school? I think um, I was, I was a pretty diligent student, but I was also sometimes a little bit rebellious. Uh, I that's hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I I never you know got into too much trouble, but I did like to teach myself things, and sometimes I would find myself um, trying to learn things that were outside of our curriculum, and so I did very well 
in certain extracurricular activities like uh, science research. Does this mean you didn't do so well in the academic world? <laughs> extracurricular is good at it. I was okay. No, I was a good student. Um, what was your favorite subject? I loved science, actually. Science and math are my strongest. Suits. Oh, and you're in government now. Yes. <laughs> well, you need some help with math and government right yes, now. That's yes, for sure. for sure. Um, you were a Girl Scout? Yes. I was. I was a Girl Scout. It was very formative, too. It, I feel that scouting was one of my first uh, experiences in a civic education. And one of the things that I love about scouting is that it really brings to the forefront what it means to be a good citizen, what it means to be a leader in your community. Really? And yeah. all the different ways yeah. that you can do that. You know? How long were you a Girl Scout? Until, until I graduated high school. No kidding. Yeah. And uh, the sash with all the merit badges? All of that, the vests and yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah, I was a senior scout. I was not a senior scout. I started out and it was that yarn dial that I could oh. never do. <laughs> and I said, I want to be a boy scout. I, I yeah. hung with my brother. And, they, uh, they started putting in more camping. Yes, and yeah. And like it, it's a lot more... Um, um, some, it's, it's not all just fun and games. It's no. really community activity and when I was a Girl Scout, we weren't. It wasn't that evolved. It was really. Yeah. It was a fun place to be. Yes. But um, no, we did badges in self defense and entrepreneurship. And yeah. I I miss that. Yeah. Uh, so you go to BU, mm -hmm. and you uh, study what economics. Economics and international relations. Okay. Mm -hmm. So why didn't you go to Wall Street or corporate America? I. I couldn't. <laughs> I actually initially went to uh, Boston University as a pre-medical student. And, um, and it, I really kind of went through this journey of feeling as though, you know, I wanted to go to school. I wanted to help folks. I didn't want to wait um, a very long time. Um, but I also started to feel like I wanted to help on a larger scale. And that's when I first started becoming more interested in economics and policy and um, even maternal health and women and our role in the economy. And, um, you know, when I graduated high school, when I graduated uh, from Boston University, we had gone through the Great Recession and my family nearly lost everything. Um, and I felt that I couldn't go to Wall Street. I wanted to be part of contributing to our community and investing in the kids in the community that I came from. And that was just, you know, that called to me. Yeah. Did you uh, work when you were uh, in college? Did oh, yeah. you work through college? <laughs> what did you do? Oh, yeah. I, um, I was a work-study student. And so I did you know, administrative work uh, at my college. I tutored in economics. I tutored in Spanish uh, as well. So I tutored other students. I, um, I've always, you know, in high school, I worked in restaurants. Sometimes I'd go back and do similar things. I, I always had to work my way through school. So I always had a job and I always had an internship um, as well. Yeah. So uh, when you're, when did you become the activist? I, I read about you that you went out, that you were helping indigenous communities in what, South Dakota? Yes. And yeah. when was, and, and then how, how did that happen? Did that lead into your working in presidential campaigns or what, what was yeah. the sequence? You know, it's funny. I remember uh, when I would first speak up about issues in college, people would say, oh, you know, you, so you're an activist. And I always thought of that that was very strange. I never, I had not thought, thought of, of myself yeah. as an activist. I really thought I'm not an activist. I'm just, I'm just expressing the needs of my community and just what we had grown up with. I'm just kind of communicating the reality of where I came from. But I think when you're communicating that reality in an environment that isn't used to that reality, it sounds like activism or advocacy. And to me, it was just truth telling. I didn't know anything any other way. And so um, in a way, I think I just felt as though I was just trying 
to be myself and do the right thing, and that was called activism. But uh, as time went on, you know, I first my first time ever volunteering on a presidential campaign was for President Obama's campaign when I was in college, um, and then after after graduating college, I moved back to the Bronx and I did some educational work with young children with the National Hispanic Institute, and. Um, and then in 2016, Senator Sanders was running in the primary and then uh, Secretary Clinton was running in the general. I had gotten involved in, uh, in the presidential election. And from there, I got more involved in the movement for black lives, in the movement to stop uh, the Keystone Pipeline. As a, as a volunteer or did you work in these, in the, within the organization? As, a, as, a, as, a, as just as a, as a volunteer, just as a normal person, just trying to stand up and do the, doing the right thing. Yeah. When did you, when did the s switch flip and uh, from being a volunteer and helping in the broad civic sense to mm -hmm. uh, deciding or thinking about running for office? Which well, is a big deal. I it mean, is, it is a big deal. And I feel as though, you know, I think a lot about um, the, the late chairman Elijah Cummings, and mm -hmm. he would often say during some of the most tumultuous times here that the times have found us. And that sometimes we make these very concrete decisions, but sometimes these decisions find us. That's true. That's and true. I really feel that my decision to run for office was a decision that found me. I felt very uncertain about our country. I didn't know what direction we were going in. Pres uh, former President Trump had just been elected. And I also looked back to my community. I always look back to the Bronx and I always look back to Queens to try to figure out what, what the direction is for the future. And I felt as though we weren't really represented. We had very, very low levels of voter turnout. Who's we, in your district? In or? my district, in my community. Uh, my community, in general, had very low levels of voter turnout. And I knew that it wasn't because people weren't informed. I felt that they had felt ignored and disengaged on many different levels of representation. And we had these very old school New York political machines that you have to work your way up for mm -hmm. decades. You showed them. <laughs> and, and it was all permission based and it was a boys club. And we had almost no women elected uh, to office in our area. And I said, you know, why hasn't anybody ever run? Why, why don't people run? It's almost as though people are selected and, and pre-chosen. And everyone said, well, if you want a career in politics, you can't challenge anybody. And I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. And I was waitressing. My, um, my, you know, my, my father had passed away from cancer in college. My family was struggling financially. Um, I was doing a lot of community work, but I also had to help put food on the table. And I thought, you know, if no one else is going to do it, then, then it might as well be me. How old were you at that time? I, I'm allowed because I know yeah. you're young, so I'm allowed to ask that. Don't ask me how old I was. <laughs> I will not, okay. but I was uh, 26, 27 years old. I was 27, yeah. You're, uh, how'd you have... Where'd you get the money? How'd you raise the money? I had no money. And you're you're <laughs> against a, a major incumbent. Major incumbent. I had no and not money. a bad guy. I mean, but you had you all your yeah. enthusiasm and your plans, and you wanted to move things along. I mean, that yeah. was pretty darn risky. I had no money. I had no connections. I had no network. The People that helped me the most were the regulars at the bar that I worked at, and they would chip in and they'd say, here, I can help you with this, or I can help you with that. And um, I just, I decided that my first goal actually wasn't going to be money. My first goal was going to be familiarity with the community. And so I asked people if they would host a house party for me. Mm -hmm. But instead of asking for donations, I just asked for people to hear me out. And I did that for six or seven months, just 
in people's living rooms. You snuck up on them. And, and then eventually the support started to come. And that's, you know, it's kind of the backwards way of doing it, but it worked for, for me. It sounds um, very familiar. Um, the, my brother's first campaign was mm -hmm. in 1972. He was 29. Mm -hmm. We had no money, no influence. We had no political party. It was an old-time Southern Democratic Party mm -hmm. in Delaware. And um, we just had vision and, you know, we wanted to make things better. And we did the house parties mm -hmm. because we didn't have money for billboards or literature. And we just went to, we called them coffees. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, it worked door to door. It's powerful. And I actually find that there's a lot of lessons that I learned from that time that applies to even our media environment today when there's so much information, disinformation out there, there's so much chatter on the television, the thing that people put the most stock in is if you can look them in the eye and they can assess you for themselves up close. And that, I think, can be very inoculative to a lot of the viciousness that we see out there because people say, no, I've seen this person, mm -hmm. I've looked them in the eye, and I know that all of this hyperbole that we hear is an exaggeration, and they can just speak to their own experience. Did you win by a big margin? Yeah, won by, I think, 13 points. That is a big margin. <laughs> God bless you. Yeah, we all spent uh, 10 to 1, $3 million spent against us. It was, but that's the power of community. Uh, okay, I have less serious question. I also, I was doing my homework on you. And uh, I read something that was really important mm -hmm. about shoes, because shoes are my favorite thing. Oh. <laughs> I work my outfit around my shoes. And I understand that you buy your shoes or wear shoes that are half a size too big. Is that a myth or is oh, that? Oh, no, no. I, I um... Because how the hell do you walk in them no, is what I wanted no, to know. I don't, I, I don't wear shoes half size too big. But um, when I went from waitressing to coming into Congress, my shoe size did get smaller because my feet weren't as swollen. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> So okay. I did have shoes that were a half size too big for a while, and then I had to get new oh, shoes. Oh, <laughs> okay. I thought the I thought you uh, you you did it because it was supposed to be more comfortable oh, and you no, would walk. No. And I thought, how does she do that? You're a lefty, right? Yeah. And yeah. I mean, correct. You're a lefty. Correct. 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 And my youngest daughter, my younger daughter, mm -hmm. is a lefty. And a lot of the characteristics that belong to a lefty, like divergent thinking, mm -hmm. you come up with unique solutions, you're problem solvers. You know, I I put a little bit of stock in that. I, I love to represent lefties. Well, and... you, you do a darn good job. <laughs> and uh, you, yeah, you're pretty darn good. Um, the legendary Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill mm -hmm. said, all politics is local. In my family, we say all politics is personal. Mm -hmm. And it sure seems like all politics is personal to you. Yeah. yeah. What it, so one too. last thing about your family when you, well, you'd all get together. Mm -hmm. were, were there any refrains that your mom or dad or your grandmother would say to you, like my parents did to all, I have, I have three brothers, mm -hmm. and my parents always, you know, I don't care what all the other girls are doing, Valerie, you're not going to do it, mm -hmm. or you can't mm -hmm. do that, or your your word is your bond. Mm -hmm. Were there pillars um, for you? Yeah, yeah. One big one in my family, uh, my dad used, used to say this all the time, he used to say, I don't have friends, I only have family. And Jeez. that to me has always been a really guiding principle. I have a very strong sense of loyalty and um, and even here in my relationships in the house with my colleagues, when we develop true friendships, to me they are very, very deep and profound bonds. And it's it's been something that's always been very important to me. Well, I mean this as a compliment. I hope you take it that way. You remind me um, very much of my family, mm -hmm. when you talk about your family. My mom said to us, there's family, and then there's family, and then there's family. Yes. <laughs> and 
when we would walk out the door, the four little Biden kids, my mom would always say, remember, you're a Biden. Mm -hmm. Not that that meant anything, not mm -hmm. like you're a Kennedy or a Rockefeller, it, that it meant you, four of you, you're Bidens and you have each other's back yes. and you stick together. Yes. And that was very much a part of, we could have our disagreements at home, mm -hmm. but when you walked out the door, yeah, you, you it was behavior. very similar. It would be very similar. And we would often praise one another or joke around one another by saying, you know, that's such an Ocasio thing. That's an Ocasio. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was it was values of loyalty, of diligence, of curiosity and of humor, too, yeah. of humor. How much do you think your Catholic faith played in your uh, concern about social justice? I think it played an enormous, enormous role. Um, I was raised Catholic. My father was Catholic. My mother is uh, Pentecostal. And so it was an inter-Christian faith household, but I was raised Catholic. I grew up in a largely Irish, Italian, and Jewish community uh, in New York. And, um, and so it was, my faith was also a source of common ground with a lot of my neighbors, but it, profoundly uh, shaped mm -hmm. my perspectives uh, from, from how we treat the poor, the sick, the imprisoned. The most vulnerable. The most vulnerable, the least of us. Mm -hmm. And what defines us as in, in our path in life is in our actions and how we treat others. May I ask you now some less uh, significant questions, of course. Uh, which I call the rapid fire questions. Mm -hmm. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I think teaching or writing. Teaching high school, grade school, college? Uh, I feel like I could teach a lot of different um, levels, yeah. either college or preschool or kinder, actually. Yeah. Oh, I taught high That's school, fun. but. <laughs> Kindergarten, I, God bless, <laughs> God bless the patients. Uh, I had enough trouble with my own three kids. Right. Ones. I want them to do what I say when <laughs> I say it, and it doesn't work that way. Um, one word to describe yourself? Persistent. <laughs> Your favorite drink to make? Oh, you are bartender. Ooh, yes. Yeah. In the summer, margaritas, and in the winter, old fashions. Very sophisticated. <laughs> okay. Favorite TV show? RuPaul's Drag Race. I don't know that. Oh, it's fabulous. I highly recommend it. Okay, I'll check it out. <laughs> Favorite music? Favorite music. Oh, that's hard. I like hip-hop and salsa music. Do you dance? Do you like to dance? I do like to dance. I'd yeah. rather dance than do anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have a hidden talent? Mm, I cannot do them on demand, but every once in a while, if I'm telling a story, I can do a good impression. Okay, I'm not <laughs> going to ask you for it. So Thank I, you. I got the caveat. <laughs> I, I, I understand. Uh, do you do uh, a range of impressions? Maybe afterwards you could tell. I'm not do sure. Do a couple for me of <laughs> somebody we both know. Maybe off camera. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, let me see. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Telepathy. Oh, that would make you really dangerous. Yeah. Oh, oh boy. Always uh, looking for an edge. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite color? Green. Mine too. What's your birthday? October 13th. October 13th. So that makes you what, a Libra? A Libra. Do you put any stock in that? I enjoy it for conversation, absolutely. And what is your theme song? Hmm. My theme song? Mm -hmm. Do you have one when you, well... Yeah, your theme song. What describes you? That's a good question. Well, hmm. I think one of my favorite songs is Aguanile by Hector Laveau. And I think that could be pretty exemplary. Too. When you go on stage, do you have a... Oh. That's a not, I mean, that's part two, a different flip. Yeah. When you go on, what, what music plays? Um... I have a lot of different songs that play. Um, I'm trying to remember what was the last walkout song that I did. I got you on something. Yeah, I you, did. I got you did. Into, um, 
I'm going to make my final remarks about you. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I would say that you are uh, a fierce, fierce woman, and I mean that in the in the best sense. You're strong. You're sometimes fierce. You're sometimes healing. Mm -hmm. You're sometimes an ambassador. But always, 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 you're a leader. Mm -hmm. And what you have done for particularly young girls, but older men and women and our, our country uh, is amazing. You make us sit up and pay attention. You make us strive and, and reach. Mm -hmm. And I very much appreciate you on a large scale level and on a personal level. And I'm glad that you're directing and helping all the other leaders <laughs> in this country make this a better world. Well, so thank, thank you. you. That's incredibly kind and very generous. Well, you, you you've so earned much. it. That's thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our partners, the Stavos New Yorkers Foundation. And remember, all politics is personal.